Well, we could probably get started. I think we probably have the bulk of the people that are going to join. Um, cool. Well, thank you everyone for coming to the director's panel. Um, they were joined by Pete and John. Um, we're going to go over a quick little intro before they talk about themselves. They have some great stuff to say. Um, Pete is a veteran anima animation director and supervising director with more than 30 years of industry experience. He's worked on shows such as The Simpsons, Family Guy, Rick and Morty, Rugrats, Real Monsters, and Netflix's Inside Job. He's worked as a director for several years and now serves as a supervising director for an unannounced Netflix show. All right. And then we also have John, who is an Emmy Award winning director with upwards of 30 years as well of experience in the animation field. He has worked on shows such as The Simpsons, Rugrats, Real Monsters, and Family Guy. And he now continues to direct Family Guy as the show continues on to its 20th season. Really long running show. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's good to be here. Thanks yeah. for having us. So we can start with uh, one of you if one of you wants to go first. Otherwise, I'll just go Pete. I think Pete's the older of the two of us, so he should probably go first. <laughs> Pete, well, we're twins, go. and I, I was born like 30 seconds earlier. So yeah. <laughs> uh well thank you for that that great great uh, introduction that's uh it's it's weird when you look back and you you know you just do these projects day by day and week by week and 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 season by season and you look back and you're wow I, that's a lot of work um but i i uh uh yeah i started on simpsons that was um uh as a case of being in the right place at the right time i was at uh, ucla going to graduate school and i moved out here from new jersey just to do graduate school, I thought, oh, you know, three years, and then I'll probably end up going back east. But um, Simpsons was hiring right as I finished school, and uh, I started as a background artist because I, I had to take a test. You know, you always have to take a test. You know, you, you you've learned that in school that uh, there's always tests to take, and and uh, uh, I failed it twice. I was trying to do character design, character layouts rather, um, but I I just didn't really know how to pose the characters and really keep the volume and the structure underneath the characters. I had no idea about that, but I was able to draw perspective and they hired me as a background layout artist. So um, then just ask questions and uh, watch what everybody else was doing. Cause I really wanted to draw the characters and just ask how, you know, how do you break down a character? How do you pose a character? What do you start with? How do you do what do you take the board? What do you do first? And started sketching in the characters in my backgrounds and my director noticed and said, Hey, we're really behind. You want to do some characters? I'm like, yeah, I'd be glad to. And then, uh, um, every time we were short on something, it's like, hey, we're short on storyboards. Anybody want to do storyboards? Yeah, I'll do that. And then exposure sheets. Anybody want to learn exposure sheets? Yeah, I'll do that. So I just kept volunteering for everything and, you know, learn more and more, you know, all the things that you don't learn in school that you learn on the job. Um, I just kept volunteering for it. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. I never thought I would be doing adult animation specifically because like when I first got into it, I wanted to make kid shows. I want to make the cut time, the kind of shows that I enjoyed as a kid because um, really when I first got out there really wasn't much in the way of like adult animation I mean there was earlier there was some things in the 70s it was you know Fritz the Cat and there was you know a couple other tv shows that came and went and, and it never really took off for for adults outside of the kids audience but um, just from working on Simpsons and then going to Family Guy and then uh, you know Comedy Central and Adult Swim I kind of like almost almost exclusively have done that, but I try to keep my hand into uh, kid shows as well, um, just to do, because you know, you don't want to get pigeonholes like, oh, you, Pete does just adult animation. So, you know, you don't want to pass up, be able to have to pass up a job or get passed over for a job that's like, well, we just thought you did adult animation. We didn't know you wanted to do kids animation too. So it's good to kind of keep a, a foot in both of those doors, but um, um yeah, going from Simpsons, that was, you know, years on that show, uh, never thought it would go for 30 years or more than 30 years, you know, when we were first, we first got picked up, or I started on season two, right out of school, and um, every time we got picked up, it was like, yeah, six more months of work, but never thought it would go on that long, I should never have left, but uh, um, went from Simpsons to Family Guy, and then uh, some Comedy Central shows, and then uh, back to Family Guy. And in between seasons, I had done Rugrats. And that's actually John and I met on Rugrats. I think it was Rugrats, wasn't it? I think it was. Yeah, it was a classic Chupo, yeah. And um, that did a lot of those between seasons. And when I could, Rocco's Modern Life, and then also did some Disney shows. Um, and then uh, from Family Guy, I went to Rick and Morty and that when that showed up. And 
that one just kind of fell into my lap was a producer that I had worked with 10 years earlier had called me and said, Hey, I just sold a pilot. Would you be interested? We'll look for somebody to, to run it. And you know, my contract had was just coming up at Fox and he sent me the pilot, which was episode one of Rick and Morty. And I said, yes, sign me out. This is, this is a great show. And did a couple of years of that, but now I'm, I'm actually back working with Dan Harmon again on, on his new show. It's actually the latest one. Um, Cause I was working at Netflix up until recently. Now I'm at Fox again. So um it's it's kind of it kind of all goes full circle and even on rick and morty i got to do the uh the simpson couch gag with rick and morty in it so it was kind of weird it's like this is how i started my career now i'm going back full circle it's like you you wait around long enough you get to do, you get to do that um and just a typical day is you know it's it's just uh correcting boards and looking at boards and designs and models and so what i sort of like about being a director and and you know, I'm sure all of us at direct, it's like you get to have a kind of a hand in everything, you know, you get to be, you get to really get into the boards is the most of what you're, you're doing daily, but you do have to, you know, look at, you get to look at designs and say, oh yeah, let's tweak this or change that or in color, you get to look at color and improve that. And, um, and that depends on the, on the production you're on, but some some shows you do get to make suggestions for lines or say, you know, I working with Dan Harmon, fortunately, I'm able to do that with, you know, if there's a line that I think might be funny, I'll suggest it usually get shot down, but sometimes, yeah, that's good. We'll keep that. Or if something works better. If you rearrange something where we do have a little bit of um, creative space to do that. So um, it's, it is uh, a lot of thinking is involved in a lot of rewrites and a lot of changes, but you kind of get used to that. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then uh, John, uh, talk about, I guess, your path as well, and, like your sure. experiences. Sure, I'd be happy to share my, uh, my story. Uh, so I did not, uh, I was not classically trained in animation like Pete was. I think uh, he went to school for it, where I went to school for graphic design up in Washington State. <clears throat> and after that, I uh, landed a job at a t-shirt company designing uh, graphic t-shirts for mountain biking and skiing and snowboarding. And I did that for a year until that company went out of business. <laughs> and, uh, and then I decided that uh, I'd seen The Simpsons on TV and thought it was hilarious. And I thought to myself, well, I'm gonna pack up everything I own into my truck and I'm gonna drive down to California and see if I can get a job on that show. Cause I think I could do, uh, I think I could do animation. <laughs> <laughs> so I did just that. I drove uh, down to, Los Angeles from uh, Seattle, Washington, and I had a contact, someone that uh, was referred to me through a roommate I had up in Seattle who said they knew a post-production uh, supervisor on a show called Star Trek The Next Generation. And so I uh, called her up and had a meeting with her where I asked her if she knew anyone who worked at Klasky Chupo, and she did. So she put me in touch with um, one of the production managers, I think over on the Simpsons at the time, who I called and went in and took, picked up a test. I think I picked up a character design test and an animation test. And I knew nothing about animation. So I said, okay, I'll do this test and uh, see what happens and try and make the best of it. And uh, I, took, I took the test home and, uh, or to this house that I was staying at with some friends and, uh, did the tests over several several days, and uh, and did a little bit better on the character design test. I thought I had to, they gave me a script page that described a couple of new characters on The Simpsons, and it was my job to kind of draw them in that um, style, um, which uh, which I did. And then I dropped I drove back into Hollywood a few days later and dropped off my tests and didn't hear back from them for a few days. So I had to call and see, and make sure that someone had received my tests and asked if they had taken a look at it. And I got someone on the phone who said, yes, we saw your tests and your character design test. Uh, it's pretty obvious, you know, nothing about animation, which I acknowledged. And uh, they said, but your character design test was pretty good. Uh, we don't have a position available on The Simpsons right now, but we have a new show called Rugrats that we're staffing up for. And if you're interested, we'd like to offer you a character design job on that show, which I was happy to uh, take. And uh, 
I went in and I don't think there was, I think there was a couple directors, Norton Virgine and mm -hmm. uh, Howard Baker were there. And then uh, Peter Chung. Peter Chung, yeah. Who uh, animated the opening title sequence for Rugrats and designed a lot of the characters for Rugrats as well. So I studied under Peter Chung for a couple of weeks um, while he was finishing some animation on the pilot, I believe. And he kind of tutored me how to draw the characters and how to do turnarounds and um, just kind of showed me the ropes for a few weeks. And then he left and I was the new character designer. <laughs> and I did that for a couple of years. Uh, I think I, I did that for the first season and during the first season, we were waiting, uh, or after the first season, we were waiting to see if we got picked up for a uh, second season. And they said, well, we want to keep you, but we don't know if we're going to get picked up for a second season. So would you be interested in working on The Simpsons for six months? And I said, sure. <laughs> and they sent me over to The Simpsons to do character designs and props, mostly props. All the other uh, character designers, uh, John Rice and Daryl, uh, what was Daryl's name? Oh, Dale Henderson. Henderson, yeah. And Henderson, yeah. He was kind of the lead yeah. character designer at the time. I think him and Scott Alberts and- mm, uh, Scott Alberts, yeah. And, uh, and myself, uh, who was given most of the prop. I was get, I got the low, low, uh, low fruit on the, uh, in the scripts, but uh, I remember we used to have to draw the designs and then we would fax them to Matt Groening for uh, notes back. <laughs> We'd wait for days, sometimes weeks for notes back from Matt. <laughs> But uh, it was fun to work on The Simpsons, and that's where I met Pete. Pete and I, uh, I think I tried to ingratiate myself to everyone in The Simpsons because I thought that was just such a cool show, and it was cool to be working there for six months. And anyways, after six months, uh, I, so Rugrats got picked up for a second season. I went back to the annex, which was the building right next door to where The Simpsons was being produced, and went back to work there for a second season, I believe. I, Pete, did you come over and do some character layout? I did some, yeah, I think I did backgrounds on, yeah. uh, on the first couple of seasons, yeah. Yeah, but that's where Pete and I met. And, uh, and uh, yeah, just we just kind of burrowed through, what, uh, three years on The Simpsons at, uh, at uh, Klasky Chupo, which was a studio that produced The Simpsons and, and uh, Rugrats initially their first two shows before that they were known as a commercial house did mostly commercial work um, which they still did actually they they mm -hmm. continued to do commercial work on the side um, and I got to do a little commercial work uh, through that department I remember doing a spot for Disney called Recycler Rex with Howard Baker and we oh. went to Disney <laughs> and uh, Disney threw us a bone and we got to do some uh, kind of fun storyboards and animation. I was doing design still, so it was my job to do some of the character design and props for that. Uh, but it was a litter campaign that uh, Disney was financing. <laughs> um, but that was kind of my introduction to animation. And then I, I worked on some of the other shows at uh, Klasky Chupo as a uh, character designer and started to be interested in doing boards. So I was given some uh, board revisions to do by uh, Norton Virgin, who was one of the directors on the first couple seasons of Rugrats and uh, finally got to do some boarding. But uh, from there, they did an Edith Ann series, I remember, oh, yeah. with Tomlin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a series called Duck Man over there, another series called Santo Paquito. Uh, which was about bugs that aired on CBS, I believe, for one season and then was didn't get picked up for a second. Um, Real Monsters, Rocket Power. Uh, Wild Thornberries. Wild Thornberries. Um, gosh, what else did we do over there? It, was, it seems like there was more. There was, they were always pitching new show ideas. Oh, a series of videos for McDonald's restaurants called the Ronald McDonald's uh, Wacky Adventures of Ronald McDonald. I uh, directed a couple uh, VHS vid videos that you could purchase at McDonald's for yep. your children. <laughs> we, I think they did eight or ten. Yeah, I worked on some of those too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there was always something to do at Klasky Chupo. It really was a great uh, little independent non-union studio at the time, but they would give people 
like myself who had no experience in animation a break and uh, an opportunity to work in the industry. Um, I don't think they ever did become unionized and they don't exist really anymore except for I think Arlene has a, uh, a small studio that she still works on uh, pitches and maybe pitches for shows and, and uh, maybe some uh, commercial work still, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I, I worked at Klasky Chupo for probably six, seven years as a board artist and character designer, and then uh, left to go work at Hanna-Barbera for six months on a show called Cow and Chicken. Um, that's where I met Seth McFarlane, who was uh, squ squirreled away in a little uh, office all to himself, working on uh, shorts for Hanna-Barbera, but he and I worked together briefly. And by briefly, I mean probably half an hour on an episode that I was boarding that he came in to do some rewrites on. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how I met Seth. And uh, and then I got uh, tapped by Klasky Chupa to come back and uh, to direct on Rugrats after they had been uh, canceled for three years, I believe, three years and it came back. They decided to pick it up and make more shows, more episodes, because more people, kids were wanting more episodes of Rugrats. And so, uh, I went back to Klasky Chupo after six months at Hanna-Barbera and uh, directed there for three or four years on Rugrats episodes and, uh, and then uh, left for another six months when I got an opportunity to work on Family Guy the first season. I went over to Family Guy for one episode <laughs> the first season and then back to Klasky Chupo to work on uh, the sequel to the Rugrats movie, Rugrats in Paris. I worked on that uh, as a sequence director for two, two years and then the Wild Thornberry's movie for another two years, back to television for Rugrats and uh, Rocket Power. And uh, gosh, there was another show that, uh, that was- Was it all grown up? All grown up. Um, yeah, and a, and a couple other shows that they were doing at the time. Um, and then things got slow at Klasky Chupo and they started to lose some of their shows. So people started looking for work elsewhere. And I was lucky enough to uh, get offered a job at uh, DreamWorks directing on a show called Father of the Pride, which was a CGI animated series uh, for NBC uh, based on loosely based on the lives of Siegfried and Roy, the two uh, magicians that uh, used to uh, perform on, uh, on the circuit there in, in Vegas for like 20, 25 years probably. Um, I did that for a year and a half. It was not picked up for a second season. And then I was given the opportunity to work on Family Guy again, which coincidentally had gone two and a half seasons and been canceled for canceled. three years and they decided the studios decided to pick it up again so twice in my career i've been on shows that were went almost three seasons canceled for three years and then came back again <laughs> um but i went back to uh, family guy as a uh, retake director for a couple of years and waited for a spot as a director to open up again which finally happened and uh I've been there ever since. We're going on 18 years now. I've worked in uh, Family Guy. Um, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Awesome. Thank it's you. It's interesting. Uh, it's, it's funny, John, you said like, like both of us, when we took tests for, for a different job that we were after and got a, a, a job that wasn't the one we were after, but it was like, okay, that's, you know, yeah. you're aiming for this, but we, we got that. Yeah, happy to have a job. And yeah. uh, the Rugrats was a great series. I mean, it was. It was. Uh, yeah. It was. Uh, wasn't the the apex of animation necessarily. I mean, they're kind of ugly characters, and sometimes the animation was a little wonky. But the stories were always good. The writing was always good. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. fun to do. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a fun. It was a fun series. Very endearing characters mm -hmm. to work with. I haven't seen the new CGI one yet still. I've seen the trailer and mm -hmm. little uh, 
little uh, teasers for it, but I, I haven't watched an entire episode, but it, it looks interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I did want to start with a couple like mm -hmm. questions specifically about directing. And I know Pete talked about this a little bit when he was uh, talking about his story, but um, could you, could both of you walk through kind of what an average day is as a director, like what your responsibilities are, what kind of, um, what kind of designs you have to address, what kind of things you have to do. And I know Pete, as a supervising director, you might have some different responsibilities than as an episodic. So maybe if you could touch on those. Sure, sure. Yeah, as a supervising director, I I work closely with the directors on, on our series. We have, um, it's a season one, so we have 13 episodes, um, but we have four directors and each director has a team of um, three board artists. And I supervise them. They, you know, each director, you know, they rotate the episodes. Um, so director one does episode one, two does two, director three does three, and director four does four. And we rotate those, but um, they will do the day to day working with the the board team and um, try different thumbnails, staging things, and, and you know, getting notes and working with the scripts. Then they will then show me the uh, the thumbnails once they're they've done their pass and they're they're happy with it. They'll show it to me, and I'm responsible for kind of um, I guess making sure that every episode done by each director looks uh, compatible with the others. So it looks like it's a similar style. It's like like it's one style of of, of drawing, cutting, to storytelling, so that it looks consistent from episode one all the way through episode thirteen. So it looks like one person directed all of them um, where it gets busy is i'm also you know things start um overlapping and then there's also you know i i look at the final boards before they go to edit uh and make whatever notes acting staging um punch-ups or anything then i get to it goes to the editor and then i will um once the director does their pass i will then sit with the director and the editor and, and just like okay yeah it's good enough uh, to send to Dan or, or show to Dan, um, and then we'll have a screening with. And it's a little different with uh, um, starting a series online on Zoom is is been challenging because no one's in one room together, so it's really hard to collaborate. Um, everybody's you know all spread around town, and we have a lot of people in different states as well, so it makes it a little harder. You can't just you know, like see somebody in the hall and go, oh, hey, you know, what, what are we thinking for this? You know, I was thinking of doing this, this, this. So it is a little bit more difficult, but with, uh, um, as a supervising director, I'm also responsible for a lot of the hiring as well. So when we first started staffing up, we knew, okay, we have spots for, we have a big crew. We have 15 board artists and, and several floating board artists that go where they're needed. So I could manage them, but I was also responsible for hiring, um, everybody on the crew so you know going through a lot of storyboard portfolios we didn't do tests because it was just logistically it wasn't possible because we didn't have our main characters designed yet so we were hiring we we're kind of doing everything all together so we were hiring at the same time we we're trying to figure out what our characters look like because the show is created by a writer not by an artist um, which made it a little bit more challenging but that was okay because I, I i didn't mind because i'm i'm not a big fan of tests uh, I've had them. I've I've made them. I've designed them. I've graded them. I've taken them. I don't like grading them. I don't like making them. I don't like taking them. Um, but I think we you, we were able to find a really solid crew just by going through you know, portfolios. But um, I'm also responsible for working with the art director. So and I also hired the art director. So I had to do the interviews for the art director and the um, the the only person that was there before me was the main character designer because he was trying to develop the look of the show. Um, but then once we got the art director in place and she was responsible for you know hiring you know the, the people in her department but i was in on the interviews with those so it was a lot of a lot of meetings you know as a supervisor you do a lot of meetings i uh, there are days where i don't get to draw like just even this week it was just a lot of meetings and i have you know boards that i'm supposed to go over and approve but a lot of times you don't get to draw as much as you want to because there's a lot of meetings there's a lot of well there's an emergency popped up you got to jump in on the zoom call and hey can you jump in on this we have you know this other thing that fox wants to do so we we go back and forth with a lot of those and and uh um, 
so and you know every typical day would starts with a production meeting i have a production meeting every day and then also right after that i do a design review so the art director shows me you know what the background artists have done that's late the latest and the color designers and, and background painters have done and also the characters that are new and coming up i'll i'll make notes on those sometimes they're more um if it's just a tweak i'll just like oh i'll just do a screen grab and just you know do a draw over and you know just put it in the chat and there it is but sometimes it's a little bit more complicated like well let me take a look at that and make that work with the uh, with the boards that we have or um also revisions, you know, I, we don't have revision artists. We do have floating board artists who do a lot of the revisions. Almost everybody's been doing their own revisions on, on a lot of our shows. So I also get to then sit in on some of the, uh, the not the writer's room, but also meet with the writers and the head writers uh, to discuss animatics or like specific things like, you know, if we're late on a script or if a script is getting rewritten a lot, then we'll go over it. Um, so it's just, uh, it, it and I do like to have, uh, it is fun for me to do not just boards. It keeps it interesting. You don't get bored doing just one thing. It's like you get, it's just like, oh, you're doing a lot of boards. And like, then you get to review character designs. And, and like, and I always like to to do a lot of that because it, it also doing retakes. And, and John's mentioned doing retakes too. And retakes is a lot of fun. When you get the take ones back, you're fixing mistakes and, fixing, and punching things up, making them look better, making them look faster. Um, better acting whatever it is um but have after doing that for so long it's just experience you know like okay i know this will lead to a mistake later on so let's simplify this character design so we don't have to track you know extra buttons on a shirt or whatever it is let's simplify that or knowing that okay i know where the boards are or how the boards are being staged so this background we need to put the door over here and move that around here so it's it's kind of fun having your hand in a bit a bit of everything so it's that's really what i enjoy about directing and then once you get to i also get to go to the uh record sessions which right now we're all being held on zoom and a lot of our cast is in the uk so our a lot of our record sessions are like seven o'clock in the morning but they're in london so it's it's a little bit uh tricky to like it's kind of sleepy over here and they're ready to go home over there but um yeah it's just it's just fun to, to kind of see all aspects of the production so as a supervisor that's kind of what i get to do is, is kind of like oversee the whole thing and make sure it's all coherent from episode to episode stylistically awesome so i'd love to hear about the uh, episodic side of it too because i know they're very different roles mm -hmm. you're you're muted by oh, you're muted john my responsibilities aren't as broad as Pete's, obviously. Uh, mine are more specific to uh, to my episode that I happen to be working on. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, uh, there's a table read for a script that uh, has my name on it. I go to that. All the uh, writers uh, at Family Guy sit around in a conference room or on Zoom and we'll read different uh, lines. We used to have uh, the characters, the, the, the actors that were playing the roles. Seth used to come in and do all the voices from uh, Family Guy, which was kind of fun to watch because he does so many of them. He you know, probably has 12 or 15 characters that he voices on Family Guy, but he could do a scene with Stewie and, and Brian and just pop back and forth from one voice to the, uh, the other. And if you close your eyes, you could just imagine the two of them on screen having this dialogue together. It was instantaneously, instantaneous and uh, really cool to watch. Uh, we'd have Mila Kunis come in and read. Mike Henry would read. He's a kind of a regular voice on the show. But these days it's more uh, the, the writers uh, just doing temp tracks of what the final dialogue will find will ultimately sound like because it's hard to get uh, voice actors to you know all come in for a table read at the same time even if it's a zoom meeting so we um anyways those are recorded uh we get to kind of uh listen to the uh, delivery of these lines to kind of see how the jokes are supposed to hit and if uh it's it's an opportunity for the writers to hear if the script is working and uh and afterwards uh there's usually a, a rewrite involved uh to to address jokes that aren't working and then i will get a revised script usually the next day 
I take the script and I divide it up uh, amongst uh, board artists that I'm given to work with. I, I have an assistant director, uh, Rick Bill Carmen, that works with me. Um, and then I'm usually given anywhere from two to three additional board artists. So I'll have a total of four board artists, including my assistant director. But I break the script down into sequences and uh, the script's already divided into acts, three acts. So each act could have anywhere as many as uh, 12 sequences sometimes, or as little as three or four, depending on how the, the locations are, are written in the script. But uh, I tend to you know, group together similar scenes, like if there's several, two or three scenes in the living room with the same characters throughout the course of the episode, I'll give all those scenes to one person, one board artist, since they've got kind of a template that they can reuse for backgrounds and and uh, they'll have familiarity with the characters and kind of where the you know dialogue and the storyline is going with relationship to those characters. So you kind of give like scenes to one person. That's that's how I tend to do it anyways, just to kind of uh, make it a little easier on my board artists. Um, but you also want to give people stuff that they're interested in boarding. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll ask them if there's anything they're interested in boarding. And if there is, I'll try and make that happen for them. Um, unless it's just not, you know, doable, which sometimes it is. But I, I like to give my board artists things that they, you know, want to challenge themselves with, or I want to challenge them with to help them improve their boarding skills as much as possible. Um, um, but we have a meeting, we sit down, we go over uh, their sequences. Once I've divided the board into uh, sections for each board artist, I go over the script with them, ask them if they have any questions. Um, and then um, they start thumbnailing the sequences based on uh, usually the table read track, which we use as a guide until we get a final track with actual character voices uh, that will be used in the you know, the actual broadcast, which kind of roll in over the course of weeks and sometimes months. Seth's usually the last one to record because um, he's so busy with other projects, but uh, we'll use the temp track in the meantime, or just, you know, after 18 years, you kind of have a sense of how certain lines are going to be delivered. So we just kind of go with our best instincts a lot of the time with regard to Seth's uh, tracks until we get them. And then there's a, always a little bit of uh, finessing that has to take place to get uh, ad lib lines that he's added to work with uh, the existing poses. And we've got to adjust things to account for his delivery sometimes. But usually we're 85 to 90% in the ballpark of what uh, the acting is ultimately. Um, but then there's a uh, character designs and backgrounds. If there's a new location or a new character that uh, is introduced in a new ep episode, um, we used to have this thing called pre-design, which was great. It disappeared like 12 or 15 years ago. <laughs> I'm trying to bring that back. I'm trying to bring oh, that back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I always ask uh, our producers every season, are we, are we bringing back, back pre-design? Because that's such a great... Uh, thing to have and usually you get a little pre-design at the beginning of the season and then the background and character design department gets way behind and uh, you end up having to kind of rough out designs for yourself as a director to give to your board artists and then the character designers and background designers will kind of tidy up my rough designs that I've come up with the, these uh, characters in new locations. So, but that, that's fun for me as a former character designer. I enjoy getting to, you know, create new characters for uh, different celebrities and just even people that, uh, you know, aren't necessarily a celebrity, but a fun character to, to design. Um, it's always fun for me. A nice little break from giving notes on boards. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I start getting a uh, so after a few weeks of doing thumbnails, we'll pitch the thumbnails to a supervising director like Pete, and uh, he will give us notes on how to improve some of the acting or the staging. We'll take those notes and implement them into cleaned up boards that we uh, add acting poses to. And then um, 
usually we will get notes on the acting poses from a supervising director like Pete and the writers. We have to take all those notes from the supervising director and the writer, writers and implement them and make sure that they're addressed properly. And then we send those uh, boards once they're revised and addressing all the notes we've received, we'll send them into the animatic department who takes the uh, boards along with the audio, the final audio that we'll be using with the actual uh, actors' voices that we need. And uh, they'll create an animatic to time with the, the boards including sound effects and music. And sometimes I'll have to find music for montages or chase scenes. You have to find music that kind of spurs the action along and it has to kind of work. And sometimes they'll actually like it well enough that we'll pay royalties to whoever the artist is to actually use that particular piece of music. Um, I can remember one example where I had this uh, episode where Meg was looking for this particular Santa Claus at this mall in uh, Quahog at Christmas. And she kept, there was a series of mall jokes uh, that, that appeared in the windshield of her car each time she pulled into the parking lot. And uh, it was kind of a bouncy sequence that uh, I wanted some fun Christmas music. So I ended up using a Michael Buble song and it just worked so perfectly with that sequence, which ended up being about 40 seconds long. I think it was a pretty long one, but we uh, paid whatever royalties you had to pay to use a piece of music like that to Michael Buble and it ended up on the air. So you never know, um, but that's fun. And then we edit down the animatic, tighten things up, make things quicker or slower, depending on uh, what we need to make the uh, action and dialogue play uh, kind of snappy. And uh, we have an animatic screening um, where we get feedback from writers and the crew and the producers. Um, we get notes, we get rewrites, we address the rewrites, we address the notes, we take the animatic to a locking session with a locking editor who locks the picture to the soundtrack. From that uh, lock, X sheets are made. We uh, do uh, lip assignments and, uh, and, uh, and then those get distributed to uh, timers who it's my job to kind of sit down with the timers and go over each sequence uh, in the animatic and call for little uh, additional bits of animation or timing that maybe aren't evident in the board. And they, they take notes and time all of the uh, sequences that are handed out to them. Um, after they're done timing, I usually get the uh, X sheets and the boards back to review, take a look at, make sure, and, and I just cherry pick a few scenes that are important to me because uh, usually they're reviewed by our timing supervisors, Andy Klein or Craig Elliott, who are awesome uh, timers and I trust their judgment for the most part. You know, if there's something particular that I want that I'm a little concerned uh, might be a little difficult to time I'll you know look at those very closely but it's usually six or eight sequences that I uh, you know a lot of it's just talking heads <laughs> it's usually action stuff that I'm concerned about mostly the timing on so I'll look at those and uh, uh, sometimes I'll kick it back to the timer or if it's easy enough or when I have time I'll do the timing retiming myself um, and then it goes to Korea for uh, five months, I believe. And they animate it over there and kick back color to us uh, five months later. Oh, and then after we ship the, the contents of uh, the episode over to Korea, there's design that usually goes over a couple of weeks later. So character design, backgrounds, uh, props are all designed. I have to approve those, give notes on those. Any changes I want to see take place, those go into color. I have to go look at color before we ship. Uh, there are color palettes for the character designs, backgrounds, any science, uh, special effects that we're asking for have to be figured out. Um, and of course, there's always a supervisor like Pete that uh, gets to give final approval on all that stuff. But it's the director's job initially to kind of give it a nice polish, first polish, and then the 
the supervising director will give it the final polish before it's sent off for uh, animation. But then the show comes back, we edit it down, there's more rewrites, um, more boarding, more animation, more timing. <laughs> it just never seems to end. Yeah. And it, it, it does ultimately. And uh, the show airs about, uh, gosh, about a year after, after we start production on it. Uh, I think those things air. Some of them get shelved. The second season of our series usually gets shelved for six months until September and uh, the new season starts up. So we're always uh, stacking uh, one season for next season, I think is how yeah. it works. But uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much the process on Family Guy. And and usually with like a supervisor, my job doesn't end when it ships. It's because uh, I will have then conversations back and forth with the overseas studio, whether they're in um, Korea, like with Family Guy and Simpsons was in Korea also. But like with Rick and Morty, the overseas overseas production studio was in Vancouver. So I would have a, a check in with the overseas, the, their in-house director up in, uh, in uh, uh, Bardell in Vancouver, and they would have a lot of questions. So that would be part of my job as a supervisor to answer those questions. Because a lot of times either the directors have moved on to another episode or you know, might be on hiatus. So I would stick around and answer those questions as well. And then also supervise a lot of the retakes when they come in. And and uh, and also like the like things like what, like which I mentioned, like doing that, the, you know, that, that final, uh, polish pass that the, the directors do that's their response the director's responsibility as a supervisor my you know when i come in to do that part um i'm really looking to make sure like oh we didn't we already did this in another episode that you wouldn't know about like um because sometimes as a director you're you're responsible for a certain number of episodes but you might not be aware of something that's happening on another episode so as a supervisor i need to be aware of like oh we already did that in episode two so in episode four let's do something different because we don't want to repeat ourselves so those are the type of things that that uh you know you know i rely on the directors to to you know really polish up their episodes and catch all everything and, and make everything work perfectly and then i come in just to make sure that it's we're not repeating ourselves or we're not doing something completely different or something we can reuse from another episode to tie it all together yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of things you guys have to keep aware of. Um, that's yeah, that's really interesting. Um, kind of, yeah, it's kind of similar. But um, another question of, what are some skills that you didn't have before becoming director, but you had to learn on the job? Then whoever wants to answer that first, go for it. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any skills when I started. I, I picked them all up on the job. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, you do as a director, you do have to wear a lot of hats, um, which again, that's for me, that's fun. It keeps it interesting. You know, you don't get, uh, you don't get, you know, complacent or you don't get not bored. Isn't really the word I really want to use, but um, as soon as you, you you're doing storyboards, you're looking at boards, you're looking for different things, you're you know looking for the acting. You're um, you know you know I stay, you know, I started as a background layout artist, so you know something I came in with was just even a little bit of knowledge of perspective was was all I really needed. But then I polished that and learned different things from other people, just even technically how animation works. It was like when I started, you know, we 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 weren't digital at all. I think. I think the color department had an Apple II computer to do color designs on, but I think that was probably the extent of the technology was digital wise. Um, but just even learning, you know, the names of things like, um, like on a background with the, with paper, you know, you have each peg hole has a label, A, B, C, D. You know, I didn't, you know, those things like you pick up on the job. Sometimes you don't, um, realize how many other things are, you know, I probably either was absent or not paying attention in school when they taught that. But um, yeah, just learning, you know, learning characters. Like when I, when I started, like when I took my Simpson test, I didn't know anything about how to pose characters, how, how to keep the volume when you turn the characters and that there's a structure underneath and a skeleton, you know, learning, learning how to do that and how to break down characters and just even to, to, to draw in dimension because mostly what I, I, mean, I have worked on CG shows, I've worked on um, some Maya shows and it's a different process. It's, it's, I've learned a lot of 
about that process too. Coming in from a 2D background, going into a 3D show, it's like, you know, when you when you first see the, the take ones, they're not all polished and in color. And they're in color, but it's it, you know, it's just the motion you're looking for. You're not you don't see the texture, you don't see the fur on the animals, uh, you don't see the um, you know the the color isn't all there. The the effects are just you know an outline and. You know, that was a surprise when I got my first color footage from uh, the, the first CG show. I was like, well, it's not done. And they're like, yeah, that's, you know, you do it in steps. Like, oh, okay. And, you know, you, you learn those things from experience just on the job that uh, you take what you already know and apply it to different. And you, you really have to just be flexible. And every production is different. And I've learned that too. So um, having worked on so many different productions, it's you, you can't say, well, this works for Simpsons, this works for Family Guy, and this works for Rick and Morty, and it should all work. Like, like no, there's different approaches to each one. So that's something I've learned is, is to really just keep an open mind every every time I go to a new production is how to do that. Yeah, you pick up things along the way. Like, okay, this worked when we had this issue or this sim similar situation on Family Guy or this, how we solved something with Rick and Morty. Uh, it's not necessarily how you solve something on Kripopolis, which is what I'm on now. Um, so you have different approaches and everybody comes in from a different um, background also. So, you know, producers come in from, you know, different shows or everybody picks something else up where they've worked before. So it is a big collaboration. So, you know, patience is, is, is a skill that, that is really important in animation just because, you know, it's a lot of work. It's very tedious sometimes, and you have to do it over and over and over again sometimes. And and um, it's easy to get frustrated with that. It's easy like, oh, they keep writing everything that worked before, and I love that joke, and now they cut it. You just have to be um, flexible and be kind of roll with the punches and go with the flow, sort of. But you know, those are those are like those soft skills. Those are not the hard skills that you learn, like you know, perspective and and drawing and. And even in you know digital boards in the software, you know that was a, a challenge too. Learn, learning new softwares, um, but also those those soft skills of 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 managing people because you're not as a director. You know a lot of times you, you hear from live action people, well you're you're an animation director. What do you direct? You don't have a set. You don't have actors. You don't have a camera. You don't have you know lights and everything. What do you direct? You're like well the answer is people. So as a live action director, you're directing people, you're directing the lighting director, you're directing the, the direct the, the DP, you're directing the actors, you're directing, you know, everybody on that set. And it's the same in animation, you're directing people. So you do have to develop some, you know, you have to have people skills. Um, and everybody, it, it, again, comes in from a different perspective from where they're coming from. And you have to find a way to get everybody's goals on the same page because everybody wants to do something different everybody's like well i like humor like this and i want to bring in this and sometimes like, well no it doesn't fit for the series the, the the humor of the series so you kind of have to dial everybody in without being you know like no that's stupid don't do that you know you, you don't want to do that because none of us like to get that note right um so it's it, you do have to as directors we have to find ways of getting everybody together and collaborating toward a common goal and that's i think that's those are the things that you, you learn as you go on the job and and you know i've worked with a lot of directors that i really admire i mean david silverman jim reardon um the, uh, you mentioned norton virginia he's amazing too so i've i've learned a lot from a lot of different directors lauren mcmullen um and i i always look like okay i like what they did how they handled this or i like how they did this situation or they i like what they do here so i i over the years i've kind of picked little bits of their own styles is how i approach things is kind of a conglomeration of all of them that i've learned from that's a long-winded way to go i don't even know if that answered the question <laughs> oh you definitely did um do you have anything else from uh, what you had to learn on the job or potentially learn on the job john you're muted sorry trying to uh, not uh, breathe too hard during Pete's uh, discussion. <laughs> um, yeah, just a lot of the same thing that Pete said, but I think working with people was the big uh, learning curve for me because, you know, as artists, we tend to kind of just hunker down on our drawing tables or our Cintiqs and uh, do our own thing. And we don't, I mean, we're collaborative with other people that need to use art for that we're creating initially. Uh, but uh, I mean, you don't have to necessarily 
give too much information back and forth. So that, that's something that uh, definitely you, you, you learn to do when directing, I think. And you, it's kind of a trial by fire. Like, like Pete said, though, um, I think working with really good directors and, and kind of uh, taking bits and pieces from their directing method that you see working really well is a good idea. You know, I think when you're working under someone and you see a, a workflow or a creativity that uh, is unique to that person, that's something you, you need to really pay attention to and uh, maybe take, you know, take on yourself at some point when you do start to direct. Um, I know uh, I, I used to give everybody the same sort of benefit of the doubt um, when, when I was uh, first starting directing and I would give people just, you know, sequences that they, uh, that I wanted to give them because they were next in line and the previous sequence kind of butted up against that one. But I learned very quickly that different artists have different strengths and weaknesses. And after working with those artists for a period of time, and I've worked with the same artists now for about 18 years. So um, I know what kind of sequences I can give a particular board artist and what type of sequences I can. Some people are really good with dialogue and acting. Some people are really good with action sequences, you know, car chases and fight scenes. I mean, those are very specific, uh, types of uh, scenes that not everybody can do. I mean, some people just have, uh, you know, a, a talent for dialogue and, and, and maybe, you know, just a, a, a group setting, a large group of people, how to stage things very interestingly so that it, the cuts around the table work and everything. I mean, that's a, a talent in itself as well as, uh, but uh, action very, very few artists are good at doing both. And I think when you do have uh, someone that can do both of those things and, and, and board all, you know, many different types of sequences, those are the people that usually ultimately end up becoming directors because they can do it all. And they have a good sense of how those sort of things need to work. So um, it is a good idea to, um, you know, be able to master both types, dialogue scenes, action scenes, um, big dramatic and slow, you know, uh, quieter moments. Um, anyone that can do all those usually becomes a director ultimately. And then you have to be able to deliver those uh, boards or, uh, you know, bits of animation, whatever, whatever you happen to be working on. Uh, you have to be able to deliver them within the uh, production schedule which is very important. Some people are very good and very meticulous, but they're, you know, terribly slow. And so you don't want that either. I mean, you want to be able to do some things quickly. Um, you want to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, different uh, techniques of style of boarding, action, dialogue, and, and, and all that to kind of be a well-rounded uh, board artist and, and director as well. So uh, those are all things I worked on when I was a storyboard artist and, uh, and uh, tried to, you know, hone my skills as best as I could before I became a director. I think it took me seven years before I finally was directing. I uh, did character design for a couple of years, storyboard revision for a few years, boards for a few years, and then finally I got a shot at directing after seven years in the industry. But again, I did not come from an animation uh, education. So I had a bit of a learning curve that, uh, that a lot of people um, who go to school for animation don't have to worry about. So it seems like, uh, you know, there's a, an acceleration there, just having the knowledge that uh, folks in an animation program come out of school with. I think that's a real plus. Took me about seven years too on The Simpsons. I, you know, going from, background arts to director it was uh uh yeah seven seven seasons it took me to yeah. Yeah. my news i guess yeah it doesn't happen overnight you don't go right from school to uh, i think even yeah. the the people that uh well i mean so it's, for some people it does but 
far and few between, I think. <laughs> Do you go right from- Yeah, there's uh, always exceptions. Right? Yeah, yeah, there's always exceptions to that rule, but uh, yeah, seven years is, uh, it went by really quick. <laughs> Well, awesome. Those are both great answers. It's awesome to awesome to hear. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that was asked by Adrian in the chat, um, and for everyone else uh, who's who's in this, feel free to ask questions in the Q and A section, or uh, if you raise your hand, then I, uh, me or me or Emily will call on you, and then we'll let you talk and ask the question yourself. Uh, so this one's from Adrian. Uh, what are the most common kinds of problems? problems, flaws, or inconsistencies that you run into when you're trying to polish an episode? Um, and I'll start with John on this one because he hasn't gotten to start for that many questions. Okay. Problems, what, or inconsistencies? Problems, flaws, or inconsistencies. What, what, what kind of issues do you, do you see the most often, basically? Most often, problems, why? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I don't know if I see um, anything, you know, typical that, that, that continuously goes wrong. Usually uh, uh, director's job is to kind of manage those problems and figure out a way to keep them from happening over and over again. Um, but uh, I'd say just the, the human element uh, of, of, uh, of working with, uh, you know, different board artists and, and things come up, you know, there's a death in the family or a baby's born or someone gets sick and has to um, um, go to the hospital for, for a while and they can't finish their sequences. Uh, it's, uh, you know, being able to pivot uh, on a dime and, and, and make adjustments and say, okay, this person uh, did half of what they gave, half of what I gave them two weeks ago, which is uh, quite a bit less work than I thought I would have gotten after two weeks. I need someone that I can give the rest of this to and that can maybe finish it in a you know, short period of time that I have left to do it. So, uh, you know, it's working with production, finding out who's available. Sometimes it means stealing an artist from another director, <laughs> <laughs> which has happened to me. I've had artists stolen from me for a week because someone's really uh, behind schedule and my schedule is a little more flexible. I'm just starting. So I don't, you know, I'm not looking at an animatic screening anytime in the near future, but someone else is. So they'll steal an artist from me for a week or two. And then I've been in the same situation where someone has gotten sick or death in the family. They've got to go back East for a week. So I steal a board artist from them. And, you know, you have to pitch these, uh, these sequences to a whole new artist who's unfamiliar with your episode because you've taken them from one storyline and all of a sudden they're plugged into this new storyline and, and they know at some point they're gonna be done with your work and have to go back to the other story that they were uh, working on. So there's just a learning curve for everybody. Um, those, are, those are little problems and issues that just come up and you just gotta deal with them. You gotta roll with them. Yeah, I, I concur. Those are it's the unknown factor that um, you can't really plan for that. And those things happen. And um, ultimately, what's on screen is what's most important. And that's what the producers are going to are going to look at. You know, they they don't want to know that it was like, well, half your crew had the flu or, you know, it's like what's on screen is, is what's most important. I, I, I think a lot of times the, the biggest challenge i think when you when you're trying to polish an episode if we're just specifically talking about you know getting episode ready to ship or you know, doing revisions and after a rewrite is the time is the schedule how much time is there in the schedule is is it's never enough there's never enough there's to do all the things you want to do that you know like okay i have to really hit these things so it is enough information for the animators overseas to help avoid retakes or make sure that everything is you know by direction is there and the character size comp is correct and um you know the acting is correct and and they're on model and and every every production is different too it's like you're what is considered a model on one show is like like rick and morty our boards are really really super rough just because of the nature of it 
because we were working so fast and, and changes were coming so fast. We never really had time to clean it up. So, but there were things we had to worry about like um, character size comp to make sure that the characters, because it, it was being done in harmony. So we didn't have exposure sheets and it was, they were using our animatic had to be really tight. So to polish that is like, you can really only polish it so much as long as the shots worked and the staging worked and the cutting worked and the poses were, at least body language pretty tight. And I always try to at least make the faces on model and tight so you can get the right expression. Um, because they would just, if we didn't have the size correction, the uh, size comp correct, then you might get a different composition back in the color footage than you had in the board. So, you know, those are probably the, the biggest inconsistencies is to really, you know, watch out for that I have to be conscious of is to make sure that that's consistent so that there's enough information in the boards to, to, to animate. And then, you know, so doing all that, there's a lot of things you want to do, but so while you have a week before it ships and you might not get enough time or enough uh, resources or people to do the, the work. So you, you, you hope for the best and you hope like, well, I have to ship it. And I hope, you know, try to, I'll, I'll write the notes if I don't have it. And you just hope that it comes back. And in first seasons are always tougher because I worked on a lot of first season series um, because there's no template to look at. There's no once you get a season in, in in the can or on the air, you can always look back at that first season. It's like, OK, it should look like that. So you can point to it. But the, that's hard, too, is like just stylistic wise, because nobody really knows what the style of a first season show is until it's done. And everybody's still trying to figure it out. And what is on in the style of a show and what isn't, those are, the, those are really difficult, especially in the first season. Like, well, what I think might be the style might not be what the head writer thinks the style. And you know, he's my boss. So I have to try to figure out what, you know, he perceives as the style, what is not just on model, but what is like the, the storytelling style, humor style, you know, what is too cartoony. We say that a lot. Um, those are those are the biggest things I think that that uh, were challenges I should say that that, um, that I face daily. Yeah, thank you. I never really kind of thought of that like just things that happen to people could definitely like tip the scale and like cause mm -hmm. um, several problems. That uh, sorry, my brain's not functioning. <laughs> What you said was a very good point. <laughs> it's something I haven't thought of before. Very good to know. I was trying to make a transition and it just kind of failed. I apologize. Um, but kind of going on to a uh, different uh, question. Um, so if you were, I know Pete, you said that you've been in the hiring position before, but mm -hmm. I think both of you might be able to uh, address this. If you were hiring a director or a supervising director for a show, uh, what qualities would you look in a person? Um, well, for directors, it depends. I, I look for a stylistic fit first. Um, for a new show, especially because uh, with, with an adult animated show, it's different sensibilities than for a kid show like SpongeBob. You know, SpongeBob is is a different approach it's a little bit more um again there's that word cartoony but it's it's more bouncy stretchy it's you know a little bit more stylized um kid shows tend to be um i, I guess there's there well, i guess where, where adult shows are more like a sitcom or more cinematic um kid shows are very different so it's a different way of drawing a little more loose a little bit more bouncy whereas adult shows have to be very tight and very structured and the characters have to move like real people um so i look for um experience in that and i, I do look for life drawing um in, in everybody but um as far as like hiring directors when we hired our directors that was something i looked for especially in the first season um if you already know if you've already worked on an adult show you know that there's you know adult humor is very different it's very more I guess grounded or you know it's not something I hate to use the word adult animation because it sounds naughty somehow but um adult or animation is not for kids but that way I guess um so hiring a director if I was and I have worked on kids shows where I've also hired directors so then I look for something different though like I'm not as concerned if you're going to be you know 
um, if you your reel doesn't have a lot of cinematic, you know, adult animation in it, I look for things that would be okay. It's more a little bit more loose, a little more free. So things don't hook up. They don't have to hook up. You're, it's a little bit more um, like a comic book where where um, like this shot doesn't necessarily have to hook up to that shot if it's very stylized. So you look for different things. And in a supervising, I never hired a supervising director. Never got the joy of being in that position. But I guess what they look for, you know, when, when they hired me is like when I got hired in Rick and Morty, I had known the producer and I'd, I'd worked with him before at Comedy Central. Um, and I had, when I worked with him, I had filled in for somebody else who had, um, it didn't work out and they brought me in to, you know, to finish the series. Um, but he told me he was looking for, um, he had a lot of other candidates, but I was the only one that had been supervising director once before. So I had a little bit of experience. He didn't want um, a first time supervising director to be on the season, a series, season one. Um, that's, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know, because I've, I've never had the, the opportunity. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, and, you know, if it's a series that already is established and, and running, um, there are, or if there's even like there's two supervising directors sometimes, you know, then you can move somebody up to supervising director that's, you know, um, been a director for a while, has a good experience as a director and directed other other series. So. Okay, thanks. Um, John, I don't know if you would have anything to add or just any perspective of something. Yeah. That you've been seeing. <laughs> I, I, I actually was a supervising director for about a year on Rugrats when I was over at Klasky Chupo, but. Uh, I think I only ever hired one person and he was a background designer <laughs> and he had experience working on uh, the show before he was a freelance artist on our show. So he kind of, you know, had an opportunity to prove himself already. And he had a, a breadth of work under his belt. He had about 10, 15 years in the industry already. So he was an easy hire, but I've never had to hire a director or a supervising director. So I can't really speak to that like uh pete has that's all good i i think that's that's also good in info to know if you're like a background designer so um i there were there were some other questions in the chat that i could ask for sure um and i have similar ones but so both of you have worked on both adult and kids shows um and it it kind of seems like both of you have kind of ended up going more in the adult route. What made you choose that over kids animation? Or if maybe you would want to go back to kids animation, why would you want to do that? You want to field this one first, Pete? Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, it chose me. I didn't choose adult animation. I wanted to do kid shows. I started out wanting to do kid shows. I got into it wanting to do Scooby-Doo. And, 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 that's, and that's still around. And I haven't had the pleasure of working on it yet. Or you know, I grew up watching the Flintstones and, um, and even though that was really an adult show, but you know, when I watched it, it was like, it was on for kids, but, um, yeah, I wanted to be Charles Schultz. I wanted to do kids stuff and, um, you know, getting hired on the Simpsons and it's it still kind of at the time had that stigma of like, well, people, adults don't watch cartoons or, and I've even had friends when I first started on the show that said, oh, I don't, I can't watch cartoons on, you know, it has to be a Saturday. So I was like, it's you know I, I didn't see the difference there but um yeah I, I i never really set out to do just adult animation but it's kind of one job led to another that you know simpsons led the family guy and family guy led to um uh, comedy central and then that led to rick and morty and so it was like one you kind of build that on your resume and then but you know you you have to be careful not to um, just do that so i i, I do when I can try to get back into kids animation because there's there's limitations like obviously like there's things that like you can't do or say and there's adult situations that you know you never get a note like you know the, the the main character shouldn't be you know hold a fork near the toaster you know you don't get that note on Rick and Morty um, but you do at Disney so you know there's there's there are some limitations but you work around those and then you find creative solutions um, but I do enjoy working on kids shows because they're they're yeah, like 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 Rugrats and and you know being endearing stories and they're they're um, there's no mean spirited stories. There's no you know no uh, 
anything that's that's um i don't know i don't want to say like you know um angry commentary or anything but it's it's yeah kid shows tend to be like more happier you know sweeter stories yeah <laughs> to tell <laughs> true true yeah i i think uh I I worked on children's and uh, adults as well, obviously, and uh, I think there's more freedom on children's uh, what we used to call Saturday morning, right? Saturday morning cartoons that would uh, air on Saturday mornings for children. Uh, there's more flexibility there. I think there's less notes from uh, the the suits. <laughs> I just remember when I was working on Rugrats. I got to see the episodes from start to finish. I was there at the sound mixes, the music spotting sessions, uh, the final mix, final color, telecine, uh, you know, final edit. Everything was, I was there from start to finish and, and uh, I knew everything that was going to happen in that episode when I watched it on the air because I was part of every process along the way. Prime time for directors is not that way. It tends to uh, be in your hands until it ships out for animation. And then you get to maybe call a few retakes and then the writers are there to make edits. They, they, they're the ones that determine what dialogues, what dialogue goes and what stays. And if uh, you know, a sequence is even necessary, they'll, they'll cut it. Um, you have no part of that as a prime time animation director, it's kind of taken out of your hand. So you can work on other episodes, <laughs> <laughs> but I miss that. Um, yeah. That being said, there's more money typically in prime time. Adult animation pays a little bit better than Saturday morning, especially if you're on a show for 18 years, you know, your, your pay scale goes up uh, incrementally every year. and. So that's a nice thing. I mean, that can happen. That happens on any show that you uh, typically work on. Usually there's a 3% standard of living increase unless you can negotiate a better deal for yourself individually, which some people try to do. Um, but typically the longer you're on a show, the more money you're gonna make because um, you, you do get a little bump every year. Um, so those are the two different things that I, I've i noticed about uh, uh, prime time and children's animation, children's shows. Oh, no, very interesting. Uh, and then we have another, someone else uh, asked a question. So Hans asked, um, being veterans in the animation industry, how much has the industry changed since you started or do you think it's stayed the same? And then, um, if there is anything that you would wish uh, would change about the industry. You'll start with that one, John? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in a few things and you can clean up uh, all the stuff that I missed, <laughs> Pete. Um, I, and initially, the first thing that came to mind was drawing with a pencil and paper. I mean, when I first <laughs> got into the industry, we were drawing on uh, drafting tables with uh, um, animation discs and light tables and uh, gosh, we're doing uh, animation, uh, what, do you, what do you call that? Uh, the, the tests under the, the machine that took the pictures. <laughs> oh, this, the, the, there was a scanner or there was a- like Yeah, a... I forget what that big machine was yeah. called. Um, but yeah, everything was on paper. Um, oh, I remember, I remember Post-its. Yeah. Post-its were huge in storyboarding back in the uh, early days. You used to take the big four by six post-its and you would put them over uh, drawings on a storyboard that you wanted to change. And then you would cut them out with an X-Acto and then you would put tape on either side of the post-it so it wouldn't come off when it run through the Xerox machine. And then I remember some had so many changes on them. I, I had some boards that had like, anywhere from six to eight layers of post-its on the board and it would get jammed in the Xerox machines when we tried to make copies of it and you'd have to go and thin out the layers of post-its underneath the board. So 
um, digital uh, storyboarding and animation is a huge is a is a godsend. It's uh, so great because you can do uh, copy and paste. Uh, you can reduce and enlarge. I remember when we were doing paper and you had to enlarge something. You went to the Xerox machine and you went. Um, I need this to be 20% bigger and you would Xerox it 20% and it would be just a little too big and you'd say, okay, 15% bigger. And 15% was a little too small. So you'd say 17% bigger and you would just go back and forth between the Xerox room and your uh, drawing table and, uh, and then cutting out the, the character that sometimes it was just an arm or a leg or a head that you were taste, pasting on that was just a little bit bigger because you didn't want to have to redraw the thing. Um, and then you could, you know, paste it over multiple boards sometimes or multiple panels. But for me, uh, yeah, digital animation, Cintiqs, Toon Boom, it's been huge. And it's so much, it just makes the job so much easier and faster. Oh, yeah, I 100% agree. That's, that's the biggest change for me, too. And, you know, because we... What also has changed because of that, um, because you can do things faster and you can do things quicker, changes faster, and uh, you can do more with it with a storyboard. You didn't have to, you know, spend the time like getting it scanned and getting then then dropped into an edit line. And before you could see it, you can see it right away. So you can tell if you're boarding too much or if you're not boarding enough poses or if you're underposing or overposing. Um, but because we can make changes so fast, we're expected to. That's the other side of that sword. It's like, yeah, you can do it faster, but now you're going to have to do more changes because you can do twice as many changes in the same amount of time. So um, we're going to expect, well, here's a rewrite and we want to see it tomorrow. And whereas before you couldn't get it done tomorrow. Um, so that's that's the other side of it that I think has changed a lot. Um, yeah. You know, for the for the, maybe that's for the better. For the you know, depends on your point of view. But but having um, having that right there and seeing it in real time and being able to adjust things and and seeing you know where to add a pose and being able to to try different things and quickly and it's like you didn't get married to one drawing because it took you all day to do or or took you hours. To, well, you can try it or you can board it this way i'll see if that works and if not oh, i'll move the camera over here and try a different way a different approach or change it because you can also you know change your own work quickly so that that i think i've become a better board artist by having worked digitally definitely yeah I that's crazy i know i was thinking about this the other day i was like in in 20 or 30 years like when we're all working in the industry like what are the tools going to look like are we going to be like in vr drawing everything and <laughs> scary to think about i will say yeah yeah who knows how could it get any better until it does <laughs> you'll be like just like minority but you're just moving things around and yeah we'll just sit there and go <laughs> just think think <laughs> think it all through yeah, yeah. um <laughs> hey here's 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 a a, a question that i I thought it was kind of interesting. Is there a favorite episode of a show that you've directed or a favorite show that you've directed that you're super proud of? And why are you super proud of that episode or show? Hmm. Pete? Um, well, I, I have to say the, you know, I, I, I do have like a favorite episode of all the series that I worked on. And of, of course, like having started on The Simpsons, starting my career there, you know, that that show always has a special place in my heart that's always you know you know people ask me like what's your favorite show that you've worked on it and, and I always have to say that one because that was the first ones where I learned everything I learned so much and that one you know I made so many friends on that show and and you know people that are still friends to this day you know, 30 years later um but as far as a favorite episode of Simpsons that that's a hard one um, but I do have a favorite episode of Rick and Morty was the, uh, well, you know, Simpsons, every Halloween show was always a favorite, you know, it, I, all the Halloween shows just so they were so much fun to do and so much fun to watch, even ones I didn't work on. Um, but I do have a favorite Rick and Morty episode, which was kind of along the same lines of the Halloween shows on the Simpsons was um, the uh, interdimensional cable episodes where, you know, 
Rick would, you know, steal a cable box. He would get into like this interdimension. He'd watch cable TV shows from other dimensions, and they were just these wacky, weird um, shows, like, like you know, you know, man versus car. You know, like uh, the car always wins. And but it was it was so much fun to do because it was it was almost like ad lib. It was like well, more like um, what's the word? Um, improv comedy. So it was. You know, Justin Roiland would just, you know, he'd have some ideas. He'd go into the record booth. I think he, you know, he would just like sit there with a beer and just like riffing on things and, and just start making up stuff at the top of his head. And you can even hear when you hear the track, you can still hear him laughing at jokes he's saying in the record booth. And we left it in. And those were so much fun to do because they were so fresh. And it was not like it, it never got rewritten. And they're like, well, let's try a different line. Like, no, they're just, you know, just let him ad lib in the booth. And we'll draw to that. And those episodes were so much fun. So the, the interdimensional cable episodes. And there was also, you know, there was another side to that too. There was a B story that, you know, you know, put that silliness against a serious B story um, about, you know, non-existence or, or existentialism. And you got something really fun. So I think the, the interdimensional cable episode one is uh, probably my favorite Rick and Morty episode. <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. I I, uh, I think I my favorite episode was an episode of Rugrats that I directed called Chucky's a Lefty, where it's discovered that Chucky is not like the other kids on Rugrats and he's left-handed and what that means, you know, as far as being different from the other kids. Um, it was a really well-written script and it was uh, not a you know, it was more of a challenging board to do emotionally, but not so much uh, staging wise, but uh, it was funny and heartfelt. And I think it won a uh, Humanitas Award. It's uh, kind of a cool thing. Ali Matheson, one of our uh, writers wrote it and uh, she did a great job on it. And uh, it just kind of, I think it holds up. I, I watched part of it a few, uh, weeks ago and uh and it's still it's still pretty good like i said the animation isn't anything you know super special but i think some of the uh acting moments really uh worked well and it was well recorded and just the whole thing worked really really nicely i remember being very proud of that particular episode oh it's so great that you guys have like memories like really good memories just all the way like Back, like back when you first started is establishing. Yeah, yeah. So another question, um, how much creative input do you get as a director? I know you guys referenced um, being able to draw and like make changes, but how much of creative input do you tend to have? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as a director on Family Guy, um, I can make creative uh, suggestions, but uh, I think about uh, maybe five to ten percent. Maybe five percent of them are actually acknowledged and thought uh, being a good idea. Uh, as as a uh, director, uh, you know, we kind of are, are 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 not told, but assumed we'll kind of stay in our own lane. And likewise with the uh, writers. Although the writers tend to get very um, specific with uh, the way they want things staged and, and acted out, we end up getting a fair amount of reference from them. Um, you know, primetime series are particularly are, are, are just known as writer driven shows. The writers uh, write these things and they have a specific uh, vision for their scripts. And so they'll give you lots of lots of input if you ask and even if you don't sometimes <laughs> you know, they'll come and say i had this whole vision in my head of this scene playing like this like in lord of the rings you remember that scene where all the you know characters were going into battle and all the different shields and swords and spears were coming out it, you know let's 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 just see if we can uh, copy that you know verbatim and then we'll change it a little bit so we don't get in trouble later <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah um 
we don't have a whole lot of input. I mean, we can make suggestions. I think uh, direction wise, uh, probably get the most uh, creative input. Uh, dialogue, story wise, not usually so much. Yeah, it, prime time specifically, you, you don't get that. Simpsons was the same way. It was a writer driven show. And then all the writers came from a sitcom background. So they were used to, this is how you do it. You write the script and then you do it uh, visually. Um, although with, with board driven shows and kids shows, yeah, you, you have a lot more creative freedom because um, you know, the writers come up with an outline. They might not necessarily write all the dialogue or all the gags and you as a director, you're a storyboard director, you're responsible for coming up with gags and fleshing out the story and coming up with dialogue. Um, sometimes you do get a scripted, you know, I've worked on, on kids shows where it was scripted um, for the most part, but you know, you, you can add some things or make suggestions. Um, with the shows I'm on now, it's uh, the last couple of, of adult shows that I've worked on at Netflix and, and now at Fox um, with Dan Harmon, it, it's, it's almost your, they're going a little bit more of a hybrid um, kind of model where it's it's scripted, but um, we are, as, as directors, we're almost expected to change the script and punch it up. Like we're expected to, you know, if we get just suggestions of gags in the script, like, well, pick one and go with that. And then, or um, yeah, if something's not working in the script, they sometimes they'll write it a little bit more vague and it's up to us. It's our responsibility now to then like make that work. It's like, okay, let's put it in a different location or instead of on a, in a car surveillance, let's make a surveillance boat. That would be work better, you know? So it's, and I think a lot of times that comes from where on, on Simpsons and Family Guy, the writers are more of a live action background a lot of other shows that, that that I've been working on the last couple of years, um, even adult shows, have been created by um, people who worked on board-driven shows. So they come from that that approach. So they're taking the board-driven approach and applying it to an adult animated show. Where, and then that's where the expectations are. It's, it's managing expectations is where, where the challenge is. Like if they're expecting. It, you to direct it like they do on spongebob well then you have to do that and not it's like well you've scripted it this way you can't rely on that so um you do you you have to add some things to it so um and it's been you know with rick and morty it was great you know i, was, I wasn't used to that it's like you know you could suggest like it would be funny if rick said this after morty said that and if they liked it yeah that's great i'll go record it and give it to you this afternoon and so you did have a little bit more creative freedom on, on like adult swim shows um but i i, I kind of like that model so it's, it's good to start with the script and sometimes you start with the characters voices ahead of time but you can they'll re-record them if you come up with different things um with the way um we're working now sometimes like also you don't get the characters voices done first as if it was a board driven show you work out the story first and then record the actors later so it's easier to change things then. Awesome. Well, I have kind of a follow-up question then I guess for in, in kind of a similar vein, because you both brought up board driven shows versus script driven shows um, and kind of the differences between those two. How, how does the director's role change if you're directing for more of a script driven show versus a, is, are there any big differences between um, directing for both of those shows or are they pretty similar? Um, I think they're, they're pretty similar, although, uh, you know, like Pete was saying for, uh, board driven shows, you usually work from an outline and that that's how I worked when I was on uh, cow and chicken. We'd usually get a, a page, page and a half of an outline of an episode. There were shorter episodes too. They were only seven minutes, but, uh, they would have light dialogue sort of sprinkled through and it was your job as a board artist to kind of come up with dialogue too. And, and then at the end of the boarding process, uh, there was a writer that could come in and kind of punch up some of the dialogue. That's how Seth, Seth and I met. He came in and punched up some of the uh, dialogue that was uh, associated with the episode I was working on um, just to get a few more gags into it. Um, but yeah, I, I was writing dialogue for, for cow and chicken for different characters and a lot of it was used. 
um, and it's a real creative way to work and a fun way to work. Um, um, not so much with uh, prime time uh, boards. You've got to, and 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 I was I was assigned when I was working on Cow and Chicken. I got a whole episode all to myself, and I realized I think on that. SpongeBob and other shows like that that work from outlines. Usually it's a group of board artists, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a team. Yeah. It's a team, team of board artists. Um, so I think you can work those sort of shows differently depending on the budget, yeah. <laughs> largely the budget, what you can afford, who you, how many artists you can afford to hire, right? And and the quality of the artists that you can hire. Um, you know, you want some uh some some people that have been doing it for a while that know how to do it and then you know a couple green people maybe that can be groomed uh to to do it well um um yeah 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 i i have the same you know the, the same uh, experience of the thing with um you writing writing while you're boarding not every not every board artist is a good writer um you know, and those are skills that you develop over time. And, and I never considered myself a good writer as well. And so scripted shows work great for me. because, like, yeah, you know, your, your job really is to interpret the existing script and it can be interpreted in many different ways. You can, there's many different ways to stage something or shoot something different and which is the best way. And that's, that's what your job is. So sometimes um, it's, it's uh it's a challenge too, depending on what you, you might need to like, okay, well, it doesn't work. So you might have to then show that, well, we need to change the script because this doesn't work. Um, but with the, uh, with the board driven show, I, I think, you know, even when I first was doing board driven shows, even the ones that were like the hybrid and I would like, okay, well, I know we need a joke in here. It needs a gag in here. So I would just come up with something, draw it real quick and just pass it on to the editor and then tell, you know, my, the head writer like oh like, you know we need this joke in here right this is a placeholder and i started to find like the more i did it the more like some of the jokes stayed in like i thought you're gonna change that and <laughs> it was like no it's a good joke we're gonna keep it like okay then so it encouraged me to do more and and write more um but yeah it's it's you, you kind of have to be you have to wear your writer's hat on a board driven show definitely yeah, no, really interesting. You know, all the different things that you can do with it. We have a uh, question from uh, someone from, from the chat. And uh, they're asking if you have any tips on how to be a better board artist, specifically with fight scenes. Mm. Do you guys have experience with fight scenes? I'm not sure. Sure, yeah. Well, I think just uh, watching uh well choreographed fight scenes you know we'll find a show that you like that's got a lot of fight scenes in it and uh watch how those fight scenes have been staged and acted and uh you know steal steal ideas from other people <laughs> that's the my best uh suggestion for people that want to learn um action films or action uh, sequences for and and you can always watch uh you know action live action movies too i mean a lot of that stuff you know translates into animation as well so um you, you don't limit yourself to just watching animated uh action sequences although there are a lot of stylized ways that you can get away with uh, things in animated shows and movies that you can't uh, do in in the live action which is kind of cool you know, you can always come up with a, a good cheat to kind of mimic a live action moment um, without uh, having to do as much legwork as, uh, you know, you might have to in a live action shot. Um, so it's, it's all about getting creative and uh, using what's worked in the past. I think a lot of people try to recreate the wheel as far as action sequences go and come up with a shot that no, one, no one's ever come up with. And it just doesn't exist. It's all been done before. <laughs> it's a matter of taking what you need and what you like and weaving it all together in a co cohesive sort of uh, storytelling fashion that makes sense and uh, 
you know, drives the, drives the story. Yeah, exactly. And, and, um, the you know, reference is, is a great tool. It's, you know, YouTube is, is, is your best friend. <laughs> um, and, and when you when you start thumbnailing a, a, an action sequence, um, the best thing to do is, is keep it loose. Just, you know, stream of conscious, just like doodle it and not get too bogged down in the perspective of the characters or worry about that later, but just doodle the action first. And like John said, yeah, you, to make it create or break it up and, and, and make, um, you know, I always tell people to use the environment, you know, use the props, things that Jackie Chan fights are great. I remember um, a friend of mine worked, uh, he was a writer's assistant on, on, on the Jackie Chan uh, animated show and they had made for the artists of the borders they've made a compilation tapes of like here's the best jackie chan fights and you watch that and it's like all the best of jackie chan and yeah he's doing this making he's not just like left right left right left right it's coming up with more interesting ways of doing that and keeping in, in the screen direction going it's like you don't want to unless you want total chaos and you want the viewer to be confused as to where things are coming from. Um, that's, you know, that's a tool that you have in your toolbox as well, but um, yeah, it has to, it has to make sense. It has to go somewhere. It has to be on the, the chicken fights, you know, from family guys, it's a great example. I mean, you know, how do you, okay. They're now they're fighting up on, on, you know, a, a, a skyscraper that's under construction, steel beams and things. Well, how do you get them up there? Well, there's, you know, different, different ways. Maybe it's a, you know, a crane bringing some bricks up or something so you just creative ways to put a and b together you know um and then to keep that going and keep the the screen direction going from making those transitions but yeah just start out with just even don't even use a computer just use pen, pen and paper just doodle it out uh, on, on paper sometimes that's just to get the ideas down and then polish it up later Those are all great tips. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so you both talked about reference. I'm curious, um, this is just kind of like a personal preference question, but if there was any like movie or TV show that either you grew up on or that you've watched recently that you were like amazed by um, and you were like, wow, this is something that really inspires me. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reference depends on what your what you, what your challenges are for a, a particular fight scene. I I, I do remember on, on Family Guy uh, there was that uh, Stewie fighting Osama bin Laden, and uh, I think that was a Dan Pavelmeyer episode he was directing. And was. you know, and how do you get Stewie's like a foot tall and Osama bin Laden six feet? How do you get him to fight to beat up Osama bin Laden? And Dan found the answer in in Yoda. You know, Yoda flies. He does these flips over, and he's you know he's got his lightsaber. And he comes up, and he can chop your neck off with you know. And the answer was Star Wars. So every fight scene is different. Every you know, um, you know, of course, if it's a parody, you know, you want to watch a particular movie. But um, you know, Marvel movies are great. We've been you know a lot of the fight sequences. You know, the show I'm on now it takes place in ancient Greece, and there's you know of course armies of thousands of people. And we've been referencing a lot of Marvel movies for that because they have some really creative fight scenes in there. I remember uh, I was working on an episode of Family Guy where it was a wrestling match. Peter's sister came into town. She was a professional wrestler and Peter had always been uh, belittled by her. He was an, she was an older sister and uh, he ends up in the ring wrestling her. And I had to watch, I had to watch wrestling matches, WWF. <laughs> <laughs> wrestling matches to get some of the moves down and uh and some of the staging some of the uh, camera angles and some of those uh wrestling shows they'll get they'll get the cameras right on the mat and be looking up at a character when they're on the buckle in the corner of the ring and just about you know ready to jump and land on the other character so we uh, referenced a lot of that stuff and then uh, of course crowd shots you've got to pan the crowd to get the crowd reaction going and uh I remember watching uh, wrestling and some uh, boxing matches, some uh, Muhammad Ali matches, some Rocky movies, uh, just anything to kind of get uh, a good sense of uh, what's going on in the ring and outside the ring with the audience. You got to bring them into the into play as well. So um, 
it was a lot of research <laughs> and a lot of wrestling and boxing movies. Wow. Yeah, and, and and there's a reason like a lot of those things resonate with and, and when you it, it's you know stealing from or borrowing from that or referencing that is those things those are things that work so if that works you know why not put it in your board if it's like well this you have to have those crowd shots to make this feel like a boxing movie or feel like a like a boxing match that you watch on an HBO so there's th different things like even um I remember boarding a, a football sequence one time when it was on Simpsons and uh, my director who was a big football fan. He's like, well, just think of it as like watching it on TV. There's that an audience will connect because everybody's seen a football game on TV. It's like, well, it's like the camera's here and the, when the team goes this way, when the team goes that way, they're defending that goal, they're defending that goal. So if you board it, like you would watch a football game on TV, it will resonate and people will like, instead of, oh yeah, that's watch a football game. It makes sense. I guess it would apply to any sport too. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's super interesting to think of like coming up with reference that isn't just like with WWE or soccer. Like it's not just film. Like if, if you want to try and mimic that feel, then referencing something like that where it isn't necessarily like shot flow or anything like that, but just the way that it looks. Uh, that's right. super interesting. Well, also in, in that case, you, you know, you're also, there's certain moves that, and if you're not, from you know, if you're not a wrestling fan or a boxing fan there's like certain poses that you want to get to yeah have you all uh, learned any anything crazy like in an episode like a new topic i feel like i feel like in shows like rick and morty or family guy like there's a lot of new topics that you probably have to get some context for in order to understand how to direct them uh if it was something like a big fight scene or something were, were there any like very obscure things that you learned like while looking up reference like learned how to like use nunchucks or like learn how to you know I, I I don't know trying I'm trying to think of unique examples of things you could maybe learn a little bit more about just by circumstance I, I had you know you know what I always struggle with is uh dance sequences mm. someone's got I, I've had to yeah. I've had to uh, board out and animate people doing the tango. I've had to board out them doing the Charleston. I've had to board them doing the uh, oh safety dance. <laughs> and those always, I mean, those are a real struggle because the more the more action you have in a scene means you know the more drawings, obviously. So you could spend a lot of time uh, posing out particular. Uh, um, dance moves and I remember uh, there was a, a woman that worked in color that I worked with that uh, uh, on Family Guy her name was Cynthia I can't remember her last name now but she uh, oh, Cynthia McIntosh director. Cynthia McIntosh, Cynthia McIntosh yeah. yeah she taught me how to tango for this tango <laughs> sequence I had to board one time and and she was uh, you know I, I had to kind of step through it but you, sometimes you have to kind of feel the move you know with your own body before you can draw it and then of course there's also a reference material I think I watched uh, Arthur Murray dance videos <laughs> <laughs> to learn the tango and and actually use those drawings to kind of sketch out the characters in these various key poses that uh, they need to hit in order to make the uh, dance as authentic as possible. But uh, yeah, dance dance numbers for me are always kind of a grind. <laughs> even even after doing all the dance sequences that I've done, it seems like whenever I have to do a new dance sequence, it's a new one that I've never done before, and I'm like, oh. It's, a, it's another box step or you know it's a waltz this time you know the, do you, are you a better dancer now no i'm a terrible dancer but i can draw people dancing really well <laughs> I, I do remember uh uh sometimes it's just even the subject matter um that you're just not familiar with i did a barbecue episode once where the the main characters this is bless the hearts uh for fox and the main character's boyfriend um he was this like amazing barbecue chef, but he was afraid to like barbecue for other people outside the family. And the, the whole episode, you know, he was in a barbecue contest, a, a barbecue festival. And, you know, just learning the difference, like, okay, you know, the, the Scoville meter for the chilies and, you know, just learning that there was like 
oh, there's a difference between North Carolina barbecue and Louisiana barbecue. One is tomato based and whether, you know, like there's different things that's like, oh, I didn't know that. And, but you gotta, you know, knowing which one is a tomato based when it came down to like to do the color, I didn't want to get that wrong, right? So I know that you're gonna get letters from people who know their barbecue are gonna say, yeah, that one's not, North Carolina is a different one. So, you know, you want to make sure you get that right. So yeah, it was just, you know, something just like that. It's like, so I had to, I didn't really, you know, get any better at barbecue, but, um, but yeah, just the subject matter, you do have to immerse yourself in it to, to really, because you have to think, and think yeah, there's going to be people who know how to tango and they're going to like, look at what you're, what's on the screen and they go, oh, that's not the tango. And I remember like, like even, uh, you know, just growing up, you know, like, um, I remember my mom spoke German and, you know, watching my dad loved Hogan's Heroes and, you know, she would like, oh, they're not really speaking German. So, you know, she would pick on those things and your audience knows those things. And so you have to be, you have to be prepared to, um, to, to put that on screen. Yeah. 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 I remember uh, an episode of Rugrats that I directed that involved a chess match between the grandfather and another guy in a park. And I had never played chess before. So I ended up going out and buying a chess set. It's a cheap one, cardboard with plastic pieces. But uh, my wife and I would uh, play chess at night so I could learn all the moves. She would, you know, just so what each piece, how it could move and kind of how the games played. And I learned how to play chess that way. And uh, I didn't continue to play chess after that. And I, uh, you know, forgot a lot of the stuff. But uh, at one point, you know, I could, I could, I could play a game and get beaten by just about anyone that played me. Riley can attest to that. <laughs> He's a much better chess player than I am, but uh, something I probably wouldn't have uh, even looked into if I had been, you know, a, a story point in an episode I was directing. That's awesome. Those are all, those are all super funny. I can imagine that over the years, you probably collect a good amount of like small nuggets of information on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think we have time for one more question. If anyone uh, wants to ask one from the chat, but if not, we'll just come up with one more or we can all just chat. Emily, do you have one? I do, oh. but if someone oh. from uh, yeah, yeah. the audience wants to ask something specific, I think Ashley raised her, raised her hand briefly, but I don't know. Uh, I see a hand pop up and then disappear. It's one, of, it's one of these. Yeah, okay, Ashley. Ashley, I'm going to allow you to talk if you want to ask your question. Go ahead if you want. Hey, nice to meet you both. Um, so if there's any shows that both of you like that aren't ones that you made can you name top three that you like top three that you like okay pete you want to go through your list first uh to think about the third one but there are some shows that i really you know as a you kind of have to you do have to be an animation fan as well but yeah there's there's some shows i, I i've seen that i i look at and go oh, i wish i worked on that um over the garden wall was was one that I, I watched that i'm like uh I, I need to work on that but by the time i watched it, it was already it was already done um but i love that one um uh i guess another one is uh um oh was it um the gum uh gumball no was it yeah right um the episode where they they deteriorate and they, they turn into like there's like they go into different worlds and or somehow they they end up going backwards and they they become um like they they start out fully animated and and then they uh uh as they deteriorate they become then pencil drawings and then they're just like you know line outline rough drawings and then they're just post-its and then they're just like really cramped but <laughs> they devolve and then i just love that yeah That's amazing yeah the episode the money that one's my favorite too yeah yeah and uh uh and, the, and um uh yeah the, the regular show also is another favorite that i wish i had worked on yeah mike roth mm, yeah 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 i uh 
I think one of my first favorite shows, obviously, was The Simpsons. That's the reason I moved down here to work on The Simpsons, and uh, that was fun. Uh, but shows that I haven't worked on, um, gosh, what was it? Oh, Ren and Stimpy. Mm. I wanted to do an episode of Ren and Stimpy, and I had an opportunity once to uh, to do a board. Pete Evzino contacted me. He was working over there. He was another guy that Pete and I worked with over yeah, on Simpsons. Simpsons. And he went to work for John Kay on uh, Ren and Stimpy, but then I think the outline got tossed and they were going to have to rewrite it. <laughs> but I think the yeah. standards uh, put the big uh, hex on it and said, no, that's a little too raunchy. I can't even remember. I didn't even get a chance to read the, the uh, script, but I said, yes, I'd love to work on that. And that was my, my one shot that I, uh, that I had. Um, what are some of the other ones that uh, would have been fun to work on? Um, gosh, uh, Adventure Time. Mm, Adventure yeah. Time is a great series. I loved watching that when, uh, when that was on. And uh, what was the other one, Riley? Chowder. We used to love Chowder. <laughs> <laughs> Just some really funny dialogue in that, funny characters, I, I thought. And then some interesting use of texture behind the characters. I remember there was always, like if it was a shirt, it was real texture. And as the character animated, the texture would shift on the shirt. And uh, it was kind of an interesting look. Hmm. But those are those are my top three, probably. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's what I liked about the regular show too, is that was the characters were they're just so weird. I mean, they, you know, there's a, a, a snowman, then there's a, you know, there's a guy who's a gumball machine. And, you know, it's just in a, <laughs> and a bluebird it's just so weird like yeah, really like, yeah yeah really creative though yeah yeah all those shows are hilarious <laughs> all right thank you so much ashley you're welcome all right well we're coming up on eight o'clock we could maybe squeeze in one more quick question uh i see hans is raising their hand so i'm gonna i'm gonna allow hans to talk if you want to ask your question. Uh, do you guys know the process behind like starting your own show? Mm. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a long question. That is a, <laughs> that's a long answer. Maybe you give a, a four sure. minute sure the long answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, yeah, I mean you gotta have an idea, you gotta have characters, a storyline. Um, gosh, usually put together a, a, a Bible in some yeah, instances yeah. of you know, the do's and don'ts of your universe where your characters live, mm -hmm. um, who their, you know, their relationships to each other, maybe a, 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 a goal or a, a, an end, an end, uh, you know, that the series has a, some sort of an arc mm -hmm. that this series might have. Um, and usually have to have a good, you know, seasons worth of episodes um, or ideas, at least outlines for episodes yeah, yeah. under your belt. So it's a lot of work. It is, and it's it's. Uh, I've pitched shows, and I'm sure you pitched shows too, John. It's it's. Uh, it can be heartbreaking. Um, it's the rejection. I have a stack of rejection letters over the years, um, but yeah, you 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 just keep going. You just keep. Uh, that's the hard part: is to not get discouraged. Um, if you have an idea and you believe in it, um, you have to also let it evolve. And and you know sometimes you get feedback from you know, uh, development executives if you get a chance to pitch to somebody, um, or even you know feedback from friends and relatives too that. Um, take it to heart you know like there's especially if you get feedback from development people that they like okay this is what we look for this is our our brand of show and you know if you're you know you have to do your homework you have to know like okay what kind what type of shows does Cartoon Network put on what type of shows does Nickelodeon have because they all do have a specific brand and style and that's what they're looking for something that's compatible with that style and 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 stick to your you know stick to your guns too it's 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 um uh, um i have pitched things where like okay this is great but you know let's add a you need add a dog so okay add a dog and then like okay they need to have special powers okay they have special powers I'll add another sister so you just keep adding things and and 
eventually it wasn't the show that I wanted to do anymore. And I just kind of dropped it because it was, or um, it wasn't what I wanted to do. So, and you can't, you also can't try to predict what they're going to want. So you just have to, you know, stay, say, this is the show I want to make and styles come and go. Um, executives come and go because there's a big turnaround in development and hopefully like you're sticking straight to your guns and you know right when the two meet that that's you know that's when you catch lightning in a bottle as they say but you can't try to predict I mean you know I, I've gotten rejections like well it's you know we're looking for more um, you know family-based shows now so okay so I rewrote it and put it you know played you know put it in a family setting and then i pitch it again and like no 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 we, we're looking for school, shows to take place at the school so i, I rewrite it so the kids all take you know, the whole thing takes place at the school now and it's like no no we're looking for more like you know science fiction like ah, I eventually it's like you know what i'm just gonna create the show that i want to make and if somebody you know at some point if i pitch it and it's at the right time you know i got it but um so far, I have nothing sold on the air. So, I mean, I've done a couple of shorts, but, um, and gotten close, but, you know, I don't have a show on the air, so I can't really speak <laughs> exactly to that. But those are just things that I picked up from, you know, my travels and development. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Hans. All right. Well, awesome. That puts us right at eight o'clock. So oh, nice. thank you so much for, for coming and, and sharing all your wisdom. Of course. Was, yeah. Glad, awesome. Good to be here with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And you two got to get together again. Which yeah. Is nice. we'll, have, we'll, we'll have to get to, yeah, and yeah. And, and I, both of you were, were my students and, uh, and uh, hopefully I get to get together with John in person again. Sometime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get together for a beer one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> when you're not traveling around the world you knew <laughs> off on some uh, pretty cool adventures recently so. uh yeah i've been that's another thing i've just been very fortunate uh, to get to go to places that uh, animation has taken me in a lot of travel so yeah. i never turned down an opportunity to travel and meet new people and, and talk about animation around the world yeah yeah that's cool oh yeah for those who uh, don't know for those who are telling me that don't know uh Pete Michaels is actually a uh, professor, or uh, he teaches classes at Cal State Fullerton. So if you want to learn a little bit more, uh, just want to have like one-on-one -on -one time with him. He teaches uh, special studies in animation. Uh, are there any other classes that you teach? Or is it just that? One? Um, no, I can really only do the one because it's it's a Saturday class. It's usually what I teach, just because it's it's too hard to get down there during the week and still balance uh, the studio job. Yeah, so it's the uh, 487E class, and that's uh, open to um, specifically uh, animation majors. I think illustration majors can take it. I think well. there have been some illustration majors in yeah. the class, too, because um, that just wanted to branch out and learn about animation. Yeah, so if you, wanna, if you want some more wisdom from Pete, he offers classes. John, I don't think he offers classes, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't offer classes. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you will. You will. I offer tutoring if you uh, get a job on Family Guy. I will uh, work with you, uh, closely to uh, bring you up to speed. <laughs> That's all I can offer at this moment. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, I think I'm going to end the meeting here. So thank you for such an such a great event and for sharing so much. All right. Thank thank you for for the invitation. It was, it was a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you so much. Thanks. Everyone have a great night, Emily. Thanks you too. Good to see you all again. Bye. Bye, Pete. Bye.